Welcome everybody to a Striatech hosted journal club. My name is Thomas Münch and I am one of the founders of Striatech. We have a bit of an anniversary today since this is our 10th journal club where scientists present their projects and data highlighting the use and the application of our products. Striatech is a dynamic uh, biotech company from Tübingen in Germany. We specialize in neuroscience testing tools, in particular for vision research. The Striatech founders are all experienced neuroscientists in the field of vision research. Today, we welcome Gristel Colon Ortiz as our speaker. Her talk is entitled Endothelial, Endothelial Caspase 9 Mediates Inflammatory and vision function changes in retinal vascular injury. Just a month ago, Crystal has successfully defended her PhD. Congratulations, Crystal. She has been working in the laboratory of Carol Troy at Columbia University in New York. In the central nervous system, not only the neurons are important. We need nutrients and oxygen, and the homeostasis of the tissue needs to be maintained. Central to this is the neurovascular unit. The neurovascular unit refers to the complex of neurons with blood vessels and glia cells, which are communicating through extensive signaling networks. Together, they maintain proper homeostasis, regulate neurovascular coupling, and overall support neuronal function. Upon injury, for example, through blood clots, this fragile balance can be disrupted, leading to neuronal damage and even degeneration. This is what Crystal has been working on during her PhD, and she has done so using the retina and the visual system as a model. In today's talk, Crystal will concentrate on the function of caspase 9, one of the signal comp signaling components in endothelial cells and how their action can lead to visual function changes in retinal vascular injury. Before you start, Crystal, let me remind the audience that you will be able to ask questions throughout the event and also to give thumbs up to other questions. We will get to those questions at the end of Crystal's presentation. When you want to ask a question, the cursor by default is in the name field. Giving your name is optional, but you have to click into the question field before you start typing your question. The Q&A panel on the right will stay available for a couple of days after the live event. So if you are currently not watching live, but a recording of the event, and if Q&A is still available, please make sure to enter your question and your name so that we can back to you with the answer. Um, we are very much looking forward to your questions. So Crystal, please go ahead with your presentation. I want to remind you that you should unmute yourself and also uh, share your screen now. All right. Um, so I should be able to share my screen. Yes. Just a second. For some reason, I cannot see the sharing. You have not shared yet. That's right. Okay, let me know if you can see the screen now. Not yet. Yeah. Yes. Great. Now it's working. Great. Um, so thank you so much for such a lovely introduction, Thomas, and for the invitation. I am uh, more than excited to be able to share with all of you my research and, as Thomas mentioned, my um, dissertation project, which focused on the um, how these um, units talk to each other and mediate um, retinal vascular injury. And we use the optodrome and you will see to test visual function um, at the end of my presentation. So as you know, the central nervous system is 
very important. It allows us to do so many things throughout the day. And because it plays uh, so many different roles, it depends on tree building blocks, of what I like to call the tree building blocks of the central nervous system. And this development, the retina is directly connected to the brain, and thus it shares a lot of commonalities, including these building blocks. And specifically, the retina has the specialized neurons, the retinal ganglion cells, amacrine cells, and photoreceptors, which allows us to see through a special, uh, specific um, process that requires a lot of energy. And the way that the neurons receive energy is through a highly vascularized architecture. So the retina, like the brain, is highly vascularized. And then you can imagine that any disruption to the vasculature can be thus very detrimental. But um, the these tissues, the retina, which is in the back of the eye, and the brain um, don't only rely on specialized neurons and uh, complex vascular architecture, but they also depend on the function of glial cells. And for many years, it was thought that glial cells were just bystanders and just watching around what was happening in the CNS. But as you might be familiarized with, glial cells are actually very important, not only during health, but also during disease as they are very conscious of what's going around in their environment, and then they can react in the context of injury. And the retina specifically has three different types of glial cells, Miller glia, mic microglia, and astrocytes. But when all of these units come together, it works like a puzzle, right? And so they form together the neurovascular unit or NBU. And the neurovascular unit, which is what you can see here, is very important as it helps maintain homeostasis, neuronal function, and neurovascular coupling, which basically allows neurons to be able to perform highly energetically demanding events then you can imagine that any disruption to the system can then lead to uh, dysregulation in this puzzle and the disconnection of the pieces. And such is the case of what occurs during neurovascular injury. So in the retina specifically during the event of neurovascular injury, what you can see here is the presence of retinal edema or fluid entrance. And that occurs because the building um, blocks of the, CN, of the CNS and the retina, this, they are disconnected and then they form this hole between um, each other. And so this creates a space for, um, for a fluid to come into the neuronal tissue. And as a result, there is infiltration of pro-inflammatory cytokines, or as you might know, these uh, signaling molecules that can be very detrimental ultimately to neuronal um, health. And because of this stage, the glial cells react as well, and so they, they form or convert into more of a gliotic, gliotic state that also um, allows them to not be able to uh, function and support the neurons anymore. And so all of these components then end up um, causing neuronal death or contributing to neurodegeneration. In the retina, then this can lead to vision dysfunction. And as I mentioned, accumulation of fluid in the retinal space can lead to substantial damage in vision. As you can see here, the neuronal layers are no longer intact. Therefore, understanding the pathophysiology of retinal edema can help to further understand or develop better therapeutic targets. And an example or a case where there is disruption in the, in the vasculature is the group of retinal vascular diseases. And as part of this group, there is retinopathy of prematurity, diabetic retinopathy, and retinal vein occlusion, or RVO, which is the disease model that we use in the lab. And what's, what is important to mention is that a lot of these retinal vascular diseases are very common causes of blindness, and a lot of them still have unmet therapeutic needs. But focusing on RBO uh, specifically, what occurs is that one or more major retinal veins will get um, disrupted or break, break down in, in by the form of a blood clot. And so these occlusions will cause hypoxia ischemia and also a um, breakdown of the blood retinal barrier or a disruption in the, in the puzzle pieces. And this will cause an increase in retinal edema or liquid infiltration. And as I mentioned, then because of the injury, glial cells will react to this. And while a lot of advance has been made in trying to understand the signaling components that um, are part of retinal edema in RBO, there's still a, a main question that remains to be 
that remains to be answered. And this is how the injury endothelium as a cause of the blood clot um, activates glial cells and then how these communication then ultimately leads to neurodegeneration, or I guess I should say miscommunication, right? Because there is disruption in the signaling pathways. And to understand this question or to explore this question, my lab uses a common mouse model of RBO. And this model allows us to understand the interactions between the building blocks. And basically the way that this model works is by an intravenous injection of the photoactyl dye Rose Bengal, which upon laser um, exposure, such as what you can see here, will form a blood clot and then this will, is what we call an occlusion and then we confirm the occlusion because there's going to be a stop in the blood flow and you will see that um, right here and so basically this model allows us to understand what happens during injury and specifically uh, the retina is a great model for this because it allows us for live and in vivo visualization of how the neurons, um, the neuro to, to understand and see and follow the neuronal state across um, time in in the concept of in the context of injury. And so um, I forgot to mention here, but we were able to characterize this model uh, pretty well in a recently published paper in the Journal of Visualized Experiments. If you are um, interested in learning more of the details of how the model works. But after we were able to characterize the model and optimize it to, um, to be able to use it with our mice, we, I went on and studied caspases. And caspases is our, the main focus of our lab. We study caspases in development, um, specifically looking at the vasculature and also in disease and different uh, diseases. But caspases are cysteine to aspartate proteases that are known for their role in mediating cell death, although some of them are also very important during immunity. And basically the way that caspases are activated, um, I like to call them the sensors of death. And basically they are activated depending on the stimuli that they receive. Uh, so the type of caspase will depend on the stimuli. And if the stimuli comes from the outside of the cell, is what we call an extrinsic stimuli, which will be sensed through our receptor, will then activate uh, different types of initiator caspases, so caspase eight or 10. And then this will activate a signaling cascade that will ultimately result in cell death. However, if the, if the stimuli is coming from the inside of the cell, this will activate another type of initiator caspase, which is caspase 9, which you might be familiarized with this a little bit more. But in a similar way, it will activate a signaling cascade that will ultimately result in apoptosis. But overall, um, there are many caspases, and they are divided in three different groups. We have the inflammatory caspases, which you might have heard before, caspase 1 is a classical inflammatory caspase that results in um, a thin line pathway that ultimately activates interleukin 1 beta. And then we also have cell death initiator caspases, which in this case, um, it leads to activate, it, it includes caspase 9, 8, 10, and 2. And then once they are activated, they activate cell death executioner caspases 7, 6, and 3. However, um, even though they are mostly known for their role in cell death, in the previous decade, a lot of research has shown that their roles go beyond just cell death. And here is just an example of that, that um, includes how caspases have been found to be relevant for mediating immune cell responses beyond um, caspases in the group of inflama inflammation. So it has been found, for example, that caspase 6 in astrocytes is important um, for GFAP or, or proteolysis and aggregation of these intermediate filaments in astrocytes. And also it has been found to be increased in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. But it is also known that caspases overall process the uh, signaling molecules cytokines. So um, caspases help to process and cleave a lot of the cytokines. And so these are just a few of the immune roles of caspases. And though after we had the model, one of the first things I did in the lab was to characterize um, the levels of caspases in a cell specific manner after RBO. So I evaluated the levels of caspases by using immunohistochemistry in the building blocks of the central nervous system. So I look at uh, caspases in the vasculature, neurons, microglia, and astrocytes. And I know this is a lot of information in this table, but what I want you to focus on is um, on the levels of caspase 9, 7, and 
So we found that there were high levels of caspase 9 and 7 in the vasculature and neurons. And when looking at the glial cells specifically, we saw that there was a significant increase in caspase 6 in astrocytes. And so these three caspases were um, of relevance and importance and caught our attention. And so to further understand and to see um, what roles were, were caspase 9 playing in RVO, we wanted to assess um, if caspase 9 was playing this classical known role of mediating cell death. And so for this, we perform a tunnel assay, which um, I like to call a myodine signal. And we perform tunnel with um, immunohistochemistry by looking at the levels of caspase 9 and also looking at this at the marker of the vasculature, CD31. And what we found was that again, after RVO, there were levels or activation of this I am dying uh, signal. But when we look at caspase 9 to see if caspase 9 was um, instigating that signal, we found that the cells that were co-localizing with caspase 9 were actually neurons, but not endothelial cells. Endothelial cells. And so you can see that here in, the, in this quantification, where again we see that the tunnel positive cells or the cells that I'm, are um, giving that that I am dying signal are neurons, but not vasculature. When we look at the co-localization between tunnel and caspase 9, again, we found that only neurons were um, co-localizing with tunnel, suggesting that caspase 9 was playing differential roles in a cell-specific context. And moreover, that it was being activated in a non-apoptotic manner in the vasculature. And so this was very intriguing for us. But to understand overall the role of caspase 9 in our VO, our lab collaborated with Scott Asniab and um, Guy Salveson to produce a specific caspase 9 inhibitor molecule. Um, and then the way that we did that the collaboration work and, or the inhibitor work is that they used the bare tree domain of the x inhibitor of apoptosis protein. And then they linked it to a cell penetrating agent. And this way we were able to design a, a cell specific, uh, caspase 9 specific um, inhibitor. And the way they performed the experiments was that after RBO, we um, gave the animals with the eye drops of Pen1 expert tree right after RBO and one day post RBO. And then we performed our ophthalmic imaging, and specifically um, OCT or optical coherence tomography. And OCT allows us to see the different layers of the retina. And if you're familiarized a little bit with the retina, you know that it is um, highly organized and very has very distinct layers. And then after RBO, we know that there is a significant increase in the thickness of the retinal layers because of the fluid that is coming in. And so our results showed that after RBO, one day post RBO, there was overall retinal swelling in the animals that received um, the, the drug and the animals that didn't. However, there was a significant decrease in the retinal thickness in the animals that were um, caspase 9 was inhibited. Moreover, we evaluated the retinal thickness throughout the timeline of eight days. And by eight days, we noticed that the, the retinas that were that received the drug or the caspase 9 inhibitor did not um, did not die as much. So the neuronal layers in this case were were um, protected from from death. So moreover, this was very interesting because it allows us to um, draw the conclusion that caspase 9 was relevant for mediating retinal edema and that at the end by eight days, these layers were preserved um, in a more significant manner compared to animals that did not receive the caspase 9 inhibitor. However, this didn't answer the question of why was caspase 9 being activated in a non-apoptotic manner in the vasculature? And so to answer this question, our lab developed a caspase 9 at endothelial and tamoxifen inducible caspase 9 endothelial knockout animal. So basically, and endothelial caspase 9 was being knocked out after tamoxifen treatment. And we used these animals and performed our RBO experiments. And again, we tested um, the number of cells that were dying after RBO. And our results showed that animals that lacked endothelial caspase 9 had a significant decrease in the tunnel I am dying signal, suggesting that endothelial caspase 9 was relevant for mediating neurodegeneration. And those animals that lacked endothelial caspase 9 were protected in a way from neuronal death. Moreover, we also found that the animals that uh, did not have endothelial caspase 9 had a significant decrease in retinal swelling, and again, the layers didn't thin out as much compared to animals that had 
cascade, endothelial cascade 9. Suggesting that endothelial cascade 9 signaling is very important for promoting um, the effects of neurovascular injury. And so what I've told you this far is that what we found in our mouse model of RVO is that there is non apoptotic expression of endothelial caspase 9 and that this uh, signaling of endothelial caspase 9 is relevant for mediating retinal edema and neurodegeneration. However, as we know, the activation of glial cells is, has, has become relevant for um, being uh, known to be relevant for neurodegeneration. And so the question that remained to be answered was what's the inflammatory role and if endothelial caspase 9 was also playing an inflammatory role in RVO in a way that it could contribute to neurodegeneration and retinal edema. So um, we know that it is at the end we see neuronal death and we also see retinal edema. But where are glial cells in this story? Does endothelial caspase 9 modulates or has an effect on microglia and microglia upon RVO? Moreover, um, it is known that cytokines are, are important in the context of RVO, and are these cytokines being modulated in a way by endothelial caspase 9 signaling? And lastly, and most importantly, what is the role of endothelial caspase 9 in vision function? Because ultimately, that's what we really want to preserve is vision. So to answer this question, um, what I did is that I used, again, our tamoxifen inducible endothelial caspase 9 knockout mouse line. And then after performing the tamoxifen injections, I did the RVO model and then collected tissue one and two days post RVO. And then I, by performing um, several um, groups of immunohistochemistry and also cytokine arrays, I was able to um, test um, the questions or to, to yeah, to see the, the um, role of, to evaluate the role of endothelial caspase 9. So first I looked at microglial cells, and microglial cells are Mueller glian astrocyte in the retina. And it's important to mention that the localization of these two microglial cells is different in the retina, as Mueller glia are present from, are expand from the retinal ganglion layer all the way to the um, photoreceptor layers, whereas astrocytes in the retina are mostly present in the nerve fiber layer and the retinal ganglion layer. And so because of this distant localization of the glial cells, I was able to tell and, and to test different levels of, and markers of gliosis based on the localization of these cells. And so whenever you see that the retinal ganglion layer and the NFL layer quantification, then that refers to uh, testing the astroglial response, whereas whole retina measurements usually um, are testing Mueller glia response. And so first I look at aquaporin 4, as it is known that low levels of aquaporin 4 can be important um, and relevant for the presence of retinal edema. And so what we found was that after RVO, there was a significant decrease in aquaporin 4 in both animals that had endothelial caspase 9 and animals that didn't in the retinal ganglion layer and also in the whole retina. However, by two days post RVO, the endothelial caspase 9 wild type animals after injury um, seem to have hi had high, higher levels of aquaporin 4 compared to one day post RBO. But animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 had a significant increase in aquaporin 4 compared to wild types, suggesting that by two days post RBO, endothelial caspase 9 signaling can contribute to a decrease in aquaporin 4, suggesting a potential signaling mechanism by which endothelial caspase 9 could be medi mediating retinal edema. Next, I look at intermediate filaments of microglial cells. And so intermediate filaments are like skeletal proteins that are known to be increased in the context of injury. And what we found was that when we look at nesting, there was a significant increase in nesting in endothelial in animals that had um, endothelial caspase 9 in the retinal ganglion layer. However, there weren't any differences compared to the endothelial caspase 9 knockouts. But when we look at the whole retina, we found that after RVO, there was a significant increase in nesting, again, similar to what we saw in the retinal ganglion layer, but animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 had a significant decrease in nesting, suggesting that um, the animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 were protected in a way from um, gliosis after RVO. 
Next, I look at another very common uh, marker of gliosis, which is GFAP. And we didn't find any differences in the levels of GFAP when we look at uh, comparing to genotypes, both in the retinal ganglion and also um, in the ONL to IPL. So more looking at the um, Mueller glia. However, by one day post R one day post RBO, we found that animals that lack endothelial caspase nine had a significant decrease in GFAP compared to um, animals that had endothelial caspase nine, suggesting that Mueller glia can be responding differently in the context of GFAP and also to endothelial caspase nine. But overall, we didn't find differences in GFAP. Next, because we saw in our in our first study of evaluating caspases that there were high levels of caspase 6 in astrocytes, I then proceeded to look at caspase 6 in the astrocytes and in the context of endothelial of caspase 9. And what we found was that there was a significant increase in caspase 6 and by two days post RVO, and that animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 were protected from this increase in um, caspase 6 in astrocytes and also in the ANL. So um, we found that there were uh, neurons that were expressed in caspase 6, and you can see that here, which speaks like two days post RVO, but animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 um, didn't have that increase. And so this suggests that endothelial caspase 9 signaling can be relevant for promoting astroglial caspase 6 um, levels. Moreover, um, it is important to mention that the protection from uh, levels of caspase 6 in the INL can be relevant because caspase 6 is, can be also another um, pointing out another um, cell death uh, signaling pathway. But as I mentioned in the beginning, it is known that astroglial caspase 6 is linked to disease and also uh, specifically is known to cleave GFAP. And so we then went on and tested this hypothesis. And moreover, it is known that it can promote G GFAP um, hyperaggregation and thus malfunction of astroglial relevant functions. And for this, I perform a Western blood analysis of retinal injured and uninjured tissue. And again, similar to what we saw in our immunohistochemistry, we found that there were no differences in the levels of GFAP. However, when we look at the cleave fraction of GFAP or the caspase 6 cleave fraction, um, which is in the 24 kilodaltons band, what you can see here, and we quantify that, we found that RBO induces a significant increase in the caspase 6 cleave GFAP fraction. But animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 were protected from this cleavage, potentially suggesting a way in which endothelial caspase 9 signaling can interfere with um, intermediate filaments in astrocytes and thus ultimately affect the way that astrocytes support neuronal function. And so for this part of my talk, what I showed you is that there are um, increase in nesting and DFAP in Miller glia, decrease in ACA.4. And when we look at the astrocytes that also show a decrease in ACA.4, but that endothelial caspase 9 seems to be associated to high levels of cliff caspase 6, which then ultimately one of the known functions of caspase 6 is being played in the context of RBO, which is a DFAP cleavage. However, we know that there is another glial cell present in, um, uh, in the retina, which is microglia. And so to look at microglia cells, it is known that in the context of injury, there is an increase in the cells that aggregate near the site of injury. And what we found was that after RVO, there, there was a significant increase by two days post RVO in the number of IBA1 positive cells, which is a marker for microglia. However, uh, endothelial caspase 9 seemed to not play a role in the number or proliferation of cells. However, we also look at C68, which is a known marker for microgliosis or activated microglia. And what we found was that there was a significant increase in the um, cells, um, the C68 cells, and that animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 didn't have the same number or a decrease compared to wild type, suggesting that endothelial caspase 9 signaling by two days post RBO could be mediating um, a potential um, microgliosis. But when I was quantifying these numbers, I found that, or I saw or noticed that there were um, these um, colocalization or the C68 levels 
and the cells differ. And so to test or to look more into this, I perform an analysis looking at the colocalization area of IBA1 with C68. And again, we found that the peak of C68 in microglial cells was by two days post RBO, even though we didn't see any significant differences in the context of genotypes in this in this, um, to, in this time point, we did saw that by one day post RBO, and the animals that lack in the caspis 9 had a decrease in the colocalization, suggesting that again, um, that there are some transient changes that the RBO is very dynamic and that endothelial caspase 9 signaling seems to be relevant for some of these microglial changes. Next, it is known that microglial cells in the context of injury, uh, their, the shape changes towards a more amoeboid phenotype. And so uh, my amazing um, undergraduate student, Albertine Neal, performed an experiment, uh, an analysis in which we were able to test the area, the first diameter and circularity of IBA1 positive signals. And we found that RBO in those changes in microglial area, first diameter, and also circularity, but only um, endothelial caspase 9 or lack of endothelial caspase 9 seemed to change microglial area and first diameter only one day post RBO, but not two days post RBO. So for this part of my talk, what I showed you is that endothelial caspase 9 seems to promote um, several transient microglial changes, such as increases in C68 and also changes in microglial morphology that can be relevant for RBO pathology. And most importantly, and something that I was very surprised to find overall in this analysis, is how dynamic the injury site is and how dynamic the glial reactivity and glial function um, is in the context of disease. So it can be more um, changing and more dynamic than what we think it is. And it is known um, that all these glial cells release ultimately cytokines that can be detrimental and found to be very important in the context of disease, but more so in RBO. And so um, in, it has been shown that levels of cytokines are not only high in patients in our, in patients um, that had RBO, but that the levels of these cytokines correlate significantly with hallmarks of RBO, such as presence of aqueous flare, measure of inflammation, non-perfused area, and foveal thickness, or, or presence of retinal edema. And so the cor high correlation between these two factors suggests that cytokines can be actually very relevant in the, um, signaling pathways associated to RBO pathology. And so to test of the role of endothelial caspase 9 in the context of the release of cytokines, I perform a cytokine array using um, retinal tissue after RBO. And what we found was that overall there were, um, like it was known before and, so, and how, and similar to what has been shown in the literature, there are levels of cytokines that increase significantly after RBO. But what we were surprised to find um, was that endothel lack of endothelial caspase 9 actually decreases the levels of, of a lot of the cytokines that are increased. And so we found that chemokines such as a fractal kind and LIX to be downregulated in animals that lack endothelial caspase 9, along with two anti-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin 4 and interleukin 10. But the vast majority of the cytokines that were modulated, uh, induced by RBO and modulated, uh, downregulated by the lack of endothelial caspase 9 were pro-inflammatory cytokines. And here I want to call the attention of IGF-1, interleukin-1, alpha MCSF or the colony stimulating factor and VEGF-A. So basically we found that endothelial caspase 9 signaling can be relevant for the type of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are um, activated or increased after RBO. However, there were um, other group of cytokines that were not modulated by RBO and these um, are found here. And this was great because we were able to grasp um, and, I, and to have an idea of the cytokines that were modulated not only by RBO, but on the context of endothelial caspase 9 signaling. And so to further um, try to understand what these signaling uh, molecules are, what, how these pr proteins talk to each other, I perform a string analysis, which basically um, allows us to see what's out there in the databases in terms of potential interactions or protein-protein interactions. And what we found was that the interactions of these cells, of these, of these um, signaling molecules, 
can be relevant for regulation of, of neuronal death and immune system processes and also immune processes. So this suggests that endothelial caspase 9 signaling instigates um, right, the, the production of these inflammatory cytokines that can ultimately be very important to promoting neurodegeneration. And so because we also know that caspase 9 activates other caspases, such as caspase um, 7, I mean caspase 7 and caspase 6, we also found that um, there were some significant interactions between these proteins. And so overall, we were also very intrigued to find that the literature shows that there are some of the cytokines that we found to be modulated and downregulated by the lack of endothelial caspase 9 are also very um, um, present in RVO patients, suggesting the translational um, potential of this model and overall signaling pathway of endothelial caspase 9. And so for this part, what I showed you is that endothelial caspase 9 signaling can be relevant for the inflammatory cytokines that are produced. And so the signaling pathway can ultimately um, be, is important and, and to be, to look more in depth into the presence of these cytokines in the context of RBO. And lastly, we'll look at vision function. Um, because ultimately that's what we want to preserve, as I have mentioned before. And the way I performed those experiments is that by using the optodrum, I, I think that um, if you're in this class because you're familiarized with some of this um, equipment, and so we performed the octodrum test before RVO and one day post RVO. And basically the optodrum allow us to test the optomotor reflex. And so the animals, when they are in the platform surrounded by rotating stripes, they perform a head movement, uh, which basically um, is, is read by the instrument as a passing or the animal is seeing. And so this equipment allow us to test two different um, functions, visual functions, so visual acuity and contrast threshold, in which the visual acuity test, um, basically the stripes get thinner and thinner until the animal can no longer see. And in the contrast threshold, the stripes get, um, they get lighter and lighter. But by um, combining both of these parameters, um, basically we tested different uh, visual acuity frequencies um, and also we tested at different visual acuity frequencies the contrast threshold. So we tested 0 0.05, 0 0.15 and 0.25. And first we wanted it to see overall if there were any differences um, in uh, the genotype before RBO, just to see overall their baseline levels. And we found that there weren't any differences in the contrast sensitivity levels or in visual acuity between both genotypes. However, um, and this analysis was done by, again, my amazing undergraduate student, Albertine, and what she found is that after RVO, there was a significant decrease in contrast sensitivity compared to uninjured animals. But um, in animals that lack endothelial caspase 9, there was a significant um, protection from this decline. And this was only seen at 0.05 um, visual uh, acuity frequency. By, by the frequency 0.15 and 0.25, we didn't see um, the same um, trend. So um, overall, this suggested that endothelial caspase 9 signaling could potentially have a, a role in mediating contrast sensitivity decline in the context of RBO. And so it's important to mention that RBO patients do present with changes in vision function, not only um, visual acuity, but also contrast sensitivity, which is often overlooked um, in the clinical field. So what I showed you in this part is that endothelial caspase 9 um, signaling can be relevant for promoting contrast sensitivity decline. So I know this was a lot of information, but overall, what I showed you is that endothelial caspase 9 seems to modulate several glial responses. So we found that animals that lack um, endothelial caspase 9 after RVO had decreased in C68 and did not um, have the same morphological aspects as in animals that did have endothelial caspase 9. In the astrocytes specifically, we found that after RVO, there were high levels of cleave caspase 6 and also associated to a caspase 6 cleave GFAP fraction and also differences and changes in um, its intermediate filament nesting. And then animals that lack um, endothelial caspase 9 had an increase in macroporin 4 and um, were protected from the increase in nesting or changes associated to gliosis. 
when looking at Miller Lea, we also saw uh, in animals that lack endothelial caspase 9, uh, differences or a decrease in the changes associated again to Miller gliosis, such as increases in um, intermediate filament expression. And similarly, we also found that there were high levels of alpha 44 compared to animals that did have uh, endothelial caspase 9. And lastly, in the molecular aspect, we found that animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 were um, had a significant decrease in the levels of cytokines and pro-inflammatory cytokines that have been associated to RBO pathology. And lastly, there is a potential for endothelial caspase 9 signaling to be associated to contrast sensitivity decline, as we found that a specific visual acuity frequency, animals that lack endothelial caspase 9 were protected from this decline. And so there are a lot of questions that remain to be answered as this um, study opened up basically a Pandora box. <laughs> um, but um, of interest up to me and to my lab is to further understand what are the long term effects of endothelial caspase 9 or caspase 9 overall in glial cells. As I was able just to grasp into how endothelial caspase 9 and if endothelial caspase 9 modulated changes in glial cells, but only at um, just um, time points very early after RBO. So the question, the future direction here would be like, what are the long-term effects? It is known that glial cells uh, might take longer to react to injury compared to other um, fast effects. So looking at long terms can be very interesting. And of interest to me is what is caspase 6 doing in astrocytes? This still is an enigma as we do see caspase 6 in astrocytes in uninjured retinas. But what is it doing there? Why is it important? Is it um, also relevant for promoting our um, preserving neuronal proper function? That's something that remains to be answered and I wish I could have the time um, and to further explore that in the lab. And another thing that this um, study brought up is that as you saw on the beginning of, of my talk, I showed you how administering uh, caspase 9 inhibi inhibitor drops um, to the mice was very uh, resulted in protection in retinal edema and also neurodegeneration. So if we think of a therapeutic, tar uh, therapeutic target here, could combinatorial uh, therapeutic of inhibitor of caspase 9 um, with an inhibitor of cytokines, could also, uh, could, the, the, could that promote better health overall for ret retinal and also vision function? And lastly, I want to call um, the attention here for um, vision scientists to further study and to take into consideration contrast sensitivity. So contrast sensitivity is often overlooked in the clinic. Um, it is mostly uh, visual acuity what is measured. And so my study basically shed light um, to the fact that at very early time points, we see um, changes in contrast sensitivity. And so measuring contrast sensitivity or being aware of contrast sensitivity decline in patients can be an early biomarker of retinal vascular disease. So um, I would, I am interested in learning more about whether if this is only happening in RBO or if the contrast sensitivity declines in, in mouse models and also in human is also seen um, to be used and developed as a potential biomarker. And so with that, I would like to thank my lab, especially um, my wonderful PI, Carol Troy, and also my undergraduate um, student, Alberti Neal. She helped me with a lot of the analysis um, discussed here, as you saw her in some of the slides. And overall, I want to thank the program, my, my graduate program, my thesis committee members, and my funding sources. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And um, thank you so much for inviting me. Crystal, thank you so much. That was a, um, a tour de force with a lot of data. <laughs> um, we already have a couple of questions and I'm sure there will be more um, coming in. Um, let me start with two questions that asked about the GFAP bands that you have been seeing. And, and the question here was whether this uh, really speaks for cleaved GFAP or if it could also simply be different isoforms of, uh, of the GFIP protein? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, there are different isoforms of GFIP, but it has been shown that the 24 kilo Dalton is specific, um, is the specific cleavage of caspase 6. 
Um, but yeah, that's something that whether there are differences in the isoforms that are presented, that's something that I didn't explore. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Uh, so one question is through what mechanisms uh, you think that the endothelial cells are mediating astroglial caspase 6? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, the, um, the nervous or unit, which is composed of vasature and glial cells, are, uh, very, are in very close contact. So any, they are very sensitive to any injury, which can ultimately lead to activation of caspases. Um, specifically, when talking about endothelial and on astroglial signaling mechanisms, there can be ways in which um, caspase, 9, caspase 9 could be activated in the astrocytes, and thus that can result in activation of caspase 6 in astrocytes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you. Um, and then there are two questions that, that relate to the RVO model itself. Uh, since you're basically injuring the, le the, the retina or causing you know, these blood clots uh, with, with a manual interference, like with, with your laser, um, how variable is that? And how does the variability of the outcome uh, influence the results that you see? Yeah, so as you saw in some of the data I presented, there is a wide range um, in the levels that I measured. Um, basically, each po a point represents our retina. And so we all the eyes that didn't, didn't have occlusions were excluded from the study. So that um, sort of like reduces a little bit of the variability. But basically, the number of occlusions, again, vary between eyes. So certain eyes that receive um, less or did that ended up having less occlusions can um, can confer or end up in having less levels of some of the markers I um, I assess. So I would say that there it accounts for a lot of the variability that we see in in, in our measurements. Do you when when you do these stainings, uh, do you particularly look in the neighborhood of the occlusions, or do you basically sample from all over the retina? No, so um, all the staining was done in a, at a similar level of where the OCTs were taken, and so that is away from both the um, injury, so, but far from the occlusion and also far from the injury. So it's at, at a level of the retina that is um, outside, so at the periphery. Okay, so it's a, um, it's a rather careful estimate of the consequences because I would assume close to the injury, uh, these effects would be stronger. Yes, right? yeah. yes. So basically we do that to limit, um, th to be able to evaluate at a more um, accurate way, uh, far from what can be the effects of the laser or also just to limit, um, just to, because you can imagine that closer to the injury is like everything will be like <laughs> very, very activated. And so to limit that. Yes, and that also gets to the next question that I want to ask because uh, uh, it is known that very local injury to the retina uh, doesn't really affect the optomotor reflex much because there the retina and the visual system integrates over a large distance or a large area. Uh, but you have seen an effect of the um, on the optomotor reflex in in your contrast sensitivity measurements, and uh, so that you know that that goes together. How far does the injury spread, or the consequences of the injury spread, to to damage the retina further away from the place of the injury, rather than it being really a local effect? Yeah, no. Um, so first, uh, the developing the um, the test for vision function took us a little bit because we first perform um, visual acuity alone and then contrast threshold alone. And so we, were, we weren't we were able to see differences in that aspect. But by combining a specific type of visual acuity frequencies with contrast threshold, that's what when we saw it. And I was intrigued, and this is something that I didn't show, but the levels of contrast sensitivity decline correlate significantly with the number of occlusions. And so I, and there was something that surprised me a lot. It was when I was seeing the OCT or the fundus imaging, some of the retinas that seemed to be absolutely like damaged didn't even reflect that on their vision function test. But then by combining both aspects, I was able to see on the, that it followed pretty um, 
um, impressed. I was I was surprised when I saw that how how much it correlated, and it made sense because the higher the injury, then you can expect it, the worse the outcome. Um, so um, also another thing is that we see that there are retinal ganglion cells that are dying as early as one day post RBO. And so we know that retinal ganglion cells are important for both acuity and um, contrast sensitivity. So my hypothesis would be that there can be that the retinal ganglion cells that are in charge or the type of RTCs that are in charge of detecting um, contrast sensitivity are more sensitive to vascular damage. And so that's why we are seeing um, those uh, um, that vision function response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there was just a question coming in, but I think you answered that. Uh, that is regarding the optomotor measurements, how consistent these test results were. So you just said that they're very, very correlated with with the number of occlusions that you that you obtained. So I guess there's a you know there, there's a tight connection between the decline of contrast sensitivity and the strength of injury, if you want to call it yeah. that way. Yeah, and I want to mention and highlight that on the work from my um, graduate um, partner uh, um, in the lab, Anna Potensky, she also showed in her model, um, so this is a completely different investigator, a completely different mouse line. She also saw that the injury, that there was a significant drop in contrast sensitivity um, after RBO, and, and she did a, a beautiful timeline, so um, be in the lookout for her work. <laughs> Okay, um, so at the moment we have one more question if there are not more coming in and that is um, uh, which cells uh, do you think contribute the most to the release of inflammatory cytokines? Yeah, so um, in the context of the retina, I would say the microglial cells and also just overall in the CNS. Um, there has been some studies that have inhibited or have taken away microglial cells um, by using specific therapeutics. Um, and so it has been shown that when you remove microglial cells and perform the RBO model, then there is a significant decrease in inflammatory um, components on, and cytokines. So that sort of like shows and, and like shed light into the role of microglial cells in producing most of these cytokines. Okay, um, un unless there are more questions coming in now, but I don't see it. Um, uh, that let me just go through if I missed one. Uh, but I think I think I asked you all the questions that came through. So, uh, Crystal, thank you again very much for <laughs> for your talk and for your presentation and your data. Yeah, it was very enlightening. And um, uh, I like to tell the audience that uh, you can, of course, look forward uh, to more journal clubs coming up after after the summer break. Um, and um, also mention again that the Q&A panel will stay open a couple of days. So again, if you're not live now watching while you while I'm saying this, uh, you can still ask further questions uh, to which we will get the answers as well. Um, so I would like to thank everybody for joining us and I'd like to thank Crystal again for the presentation. And uh, I wish uh, everybody a wonderful and great summer. Thank you.